All right, let's uh, move on to talk about the rank of a matrix today. Now, first, a little bit of review. Um, remember, the uh, column space of a matrix is the set of all linear combinations of the columns, which is also the span of the set of columns of the matrix. So we're going to talk about a, a, another subspace, um, this time the row space of a matrix. So we know what the column space is, so what do you think the row space of a matrix uh, is? Mm, well, if you just take the analogous uh, route, then we get uh, the row space of a matrix is a set of all linear combinations of the rows or the span of the set of rows of the matrix. So it is truly just the analogous uh, term to the column space. Okay, we have the column space, all linear combinations of the columns, row space, all linear combinations of the rows. Okay, so think back to find a basis for the column space of a matrix. Uh, we put the matrix in echelon form so that we can determine which columns are the pivot columns. Then we go back to the original matrix and pull out those columns, and that's a basis for the column space of the original matrix. So the question is, how do we find a basis for the row space of a matrix? And here, uh, the similarities end somewhat, although there still are some similarities. Um, but this theorem tells us how we can find a basis for the row space of a matrix. Okay, so it says if two matrices A and B are row equivalent, all right, so you can get from one to the other doing elementary row operations. Then their row spaces are the same. Now you'll recall that that is not true for the column spaces. When you do elementary row operations, you may be changing the column space of the matrix. But this theorem tells us that, that for row space, that stays the same when you do row operations. Okay, If B is in echelon form, the non-zero rows of B form a basis for the row space of A as well as for that of B. Okay, so this tells us to find a basis for the row space of A, we put it in echelon form and pull the non-zero rows from that echelon form matrix, and we have uh, a basis for the row space of the original matrix plus uh, the echelon form matrix and any uh, intermediate matrices that we encountered. Okay, so again, elementary row operations um, do not change uh, uh, this back up here. Uh, this is talking about the linear dependence relationships among the columns. Okay, so that means like if the second column of A is uh, 10 times the first column, then when you do elementary row operations, that doesn't change. So elementary row operations do not change the linear dependence relationships among the columns of a matrix. However, they can change the linear dependence relationships among the rows of a matrix. Okay, so let's look at a little simple example. We start off with this matrix A. Uh, we do uh, one row operation, end up with this one, which I'll call B. Now, a basis for the column space of A, right, we, um, we could just look at A and say, well, I can see that the second column is a multiple of the first, so I throw it out and just keep the first column. Or you could look at B and see where are the pivot positions in B. Well, there's only one in the first column, so that means we want to pull the first column for A from A uh, to be a basis for the column space of A. Um, if we want a basis for the column space of B, that's that's straightforward because B is already in echelon form. So we just pull. We know what the pivot columns are. There's only one first column, so that's a basis for the column space of B. Okay, so if we look graphically at the column space of each of these matrices, okay, the red line here, um, you can see this vector right here, this is 1, 1, and so this red line is any multiple of the vector 1, 1, so that's, the red line is the column space of A. Uh, this vector here is 1, 0, and since that's a basis for the column space of B, the blue line, or the x-axis, is the column space of B, right? All multiples of 1, 0. So clearly here, these uh, column spaces are not the same, right? They, the uh, 
these matrices are row equivalent, but their column spaces are not the same. All right, let's look again. Same set of matrices. Now, the row spaces are the same because we want a basis for the row space of A. Then, right, we look at each row of A. Well, they're the same row, right? Each row is the same, and so we only need one of them. Throw out the second one, and we keep the first row, and that's a basis for the row space of A. Right, if we were using the theorem, we would get A in echelon form, which we have here, and take the non-zero rows of that matrix. Well, the non-zero rows is just that row 1, 2. So either way you look at it, you end up with this basis for the row space of A. And similarly for the row space of B, um, it's going to be all multiples of the row 1, 2, because 0, 0 doesn't add anything to the picture. So this set, which consists of just that one row, is a basis for both the row space of A and the row space of B. Now let's look at a little, uh, a little more uh, interesting example. Um, there's a big matrix A, and uh, after some row operations, we end up with this version of A. Okay, this is an echelon form, and we'll call that matrix B. Okay, so to get a basis for the column space of A, we look at B, we can see that there's a pivot position in the first column, the second column, and the fourth column. So we choose those columns out of A, first column, second column, and the fourth column, and that's a basis for the column space of A. So the dimension of the column space of A is the number of vectors in this basis, which is 3. To get a basis for the column space of B, um, we look at B, it's already in echelon form, so we choose the non, uh, I choose the pivot columns, and so we get the first, second, and fourth columns. That's columns, the basis for the column space of B. And the dimension of the column space of B, count the vectors in a basis, that's 3. So the dimension of the column space of B is 3. Um, Alright, what about a basis for the row space of A? which we know from the theorem will also be a basis for the row space of B. Well, according to the theorem, put A in echelon form and choose the non-zero rows. So we do that, we get the first, second, and third rows of B, which are given here. So the dimension of the row space of A is equal to the dimension of the row space of B, and notice there's three vectors here, so that is three. All right, so we got the dimension of the column space of A is 3, dimension of the row space of A is 3, and the question is, is this a coincidence that they're both the same value? And uh, if you think about that just a little bit, uh, you can say, no, um, I don't think so, because the dimension of the column space of A is the number of pivot columns or pivot positions in A, and that's... Uh, you know, we look at B to figure that out, but there's three pivot positions. And uh, the dimension of the row space of A is also equal to the number of pivot positions because there's a pivot position in each non-zero row in B here, or in an echelon form of A. So every, each of these values is based off of the number of pivot positions, right? Because a pivot position defines a pivot column and a pivot position defines a non-zero row. So, uh, for any matrix, the dimension of the column space is equal to the dimension of the row space, which is equal to the number of pivot positions in that matrix. Okay, and this quantity is what we call the rank of a matrix. Okay, the rank of a matrix is the dimension of the column space which is also equal to the dimension of the row space of that matrix. Okay, so we just call that the rank of the matrix. All right, back to this one. Let's talk about the null space. Um, what is the dimension of the null space of A? Well, we end up with a... Uh, a, a we want to find a basis for the null space, right? We um, solve AX equals zero and write our solution in parametric vector form and those vectors will be a basis for the null space of A. Now um, how many vectors do you end up with in that case? 
Well, you end up with one for each free variable, okay? Key is one for each free variable. And if you think about that a little more, you think, hmm, well, where do I get a free variable? Well, it's a free variable is one whose column does not contain a pivot position. So the dimension of the null space is the number of free variables uh, in AX equals zero, also equal to the number of non-pivot columns in the matrix. Okay, for this particular matrix, dimension of the null space is three because here's a non-pivot column, uh, the third one, and the fourth and oh, fifth and sixth. So the third column, fifth column, sixth column are all non-pivot columns. So we have three non-pivot columns, and therefore the dimension of the null space is three. All right. So once again, this number three pops up. We have dimension of the column space is three, dimension of the null space is three. So I ask again, is this a coincidence? Hmm. And the answer is, yes, it is a coincidence. It's coincidence because uh, dimension of the column space is the number of pivot columns. Dimension of the null space is the number of non-pivot columns. So when you add them together, you get what? The number of columns in the matrix. Um, so it just so happened that there were six columns in this matrix. And so if the dimension of the column space is three, then the dimension of the null space is going to be six minus three, which is also three. So that's totally coincidence. Had there been seven columns, the dimension of the null space would have been four. All right, so we have the dimension of the column space plus the dimension of the null space is equal to the number of columns. And since the dimension of the column space is equal to the dimension of the row space, we have the dimension of the row space plus the dimension of the null space is equal to the number of columns. And one more time, since the dimension of the column space and the dimension of the row space are equal to the rank of A, we have the rank plus the dimension of the null space is equal to the number of columns. Okay, so in this section we have uh, another installment of the invertible matrix theorem. And if you uh, recall, uh, we had this version of it, or this installment of it back in section 2.3. Um, and uh, so this should be seared into your memory at this point. If not, you go back and review it. Um, but uh, one of the pertinent things is, uh, uh, recall that the whole idea here is that all these statements are equivalent, uh, which means that they're either all true or all false. Number one here says A is an invertible matrix. Now one of the most important pieces of this is number three, that A has n pivot positions. Because if you recall, when I was telling you about how to uh, remember all this, I told you the easiest way is to relate everything to pivot positions. So if we can establish uh, for any part of this that A has n pivot positions, then we're done. All right, so what we have new here, well, we have six new things. Four of them are given here, so let's take a look at these. Uh, number one says the columns of A form a basis for Rn. Okay, um, if that's true, if they're a basis for Rn, then that means uh, that they must be linearly independent and they must span Rn. Either one of those says that there's a pivot position in every row and every column. Therefore, they're in pivot positions, so A is invertible. Uh, the column space of A equals Rn. Uh, that means that uh, the columns of A span Rn, which again, they can only do that if there's a pivot position in every row, meaning there's n pivot positions. The dimension of the column space is n. Um, that actually falls from number two here. Um, if column space of A equals Rn, you, we know that there are n vectors and a basis for Rn, so therefore the dimension of the column space is n. And the rank of A equals n, that follows from number three, since the dimension of the column space is equal to the rank of a matrix. Okay, then we have two more that deal with the null space. Um, null space of A is just the zero vector. Okay, so if that's true, 
then that means that if we look at the system AX equals zero, it has only the trivial solution. That happens when there are no free variables, which means there's a pivot position in every column, which means there are n pivot positions. And uh, from number five follows number six, because uh, the, if you have only the zero vector, uh, then that's a special case, and we define the dimension of that vector space to be zero. All right, so all these are equivalent to the statement that A is an invertible matrix. So just like with those, uh, the first 10, I believe it was, let's see, yep, first 10, uh, these, these extra six, you need to commit them to memory, relating them to, to each other or to pivot positions. All right, uh, I want to go through some of the, some of the problems uh, at the end of this section because there's some excellent problems here. Uh, in fact, this section I think is the most important section in the course, so make sure that you um, really work on these problems and understand what you're doing here. So I'm going to do several of them at the end of the section. Okay, so the first one says, suppose uh, a 5 by 6 matrix, let's call it A, has four pivot columns. Okay, so it's a 5 by 6 matrix with four pivot columns. Okay, if it has four pivot columns, um, then that means it has two non-pivot columns. So what's the dimension of the null space of A? Must be two, right, because you've got two non-pivot columns. Um, is the column space of A equal to R4? Well, um, the dimension of the column space is 4 because we have four pivot columns. Okay, So the dimension of the column space is 4, but the columns are in R5, and therefore um, they uh, uh, are the span of the columns is not equal to R4. Uh, it's just a subset of R5. All right. Next one, if the null space of a 7 by 6 matrix is 5-dimensional, okay, so that means you have 5 non-pivot columns, which means out of 6 columns, 1 is a pivot column, then therefore the dimension of the column space has to be 1. All right, suppose the null space of a 5 by 6 matrix is 4-dimensional then that means you have four non-pivot columns, so that leaves two pivot columns. And uh, we want to know the row, dimension of the row space. We have two pivot columns, so that means we have two non-zero rows when we put the matrix in echelon form. So the dimension of the row space is two. All right, how about if A is four by three? What is the largest possible dimension of the row space? All right, well, if A is 4 by 3, then uh, we could have uh, at most three pivot positions, so at most three non-zero rows when we put it in echelon form. So the maximum dimension of the row space is 3. All right, uh, if A is 3 by 4, what's the largest possible dimension of the row space? It's three by four, then the again the maximum number of pivot positions we can have is three, so we have at most three non-zero rows, so the maximum dimension of the row space is three. Uh, how about if A is six by four? What is the smallest possible dimension of the null space? So that's asking what's the smallest number of free variables you can have, in, or what's the smallest number of non-pivot columns you could have? Well, since we have more rows than columns, every column could be a pivot column, in which case uh, there's no free variables, and so the minimum dimension of the null space of A would be zero. All right, a little more complicated one here. Um, suppose a non-homogeneous system of six equations and eight unknowns has a solution with two free variables. Is it possible to change some constants on the equation's right sides to make the new system inconsistent? All right, so we got a non-homogeneous system, six equations and eight unknowns and it's consistent, 
with two free variables. Now what that tells you with the two free variables is that um, you have, since there's eight unknowns, we got eight columns. Two are free, so that means there are six that are pivot columns. Okay, so that would look like this. We've got six rows here, eight columns, um, two free variables, which leaves six pivot columns. All right, and it's saying if we change the right hand side, will the system still be consistent? And the answer is yes. Um, plug my computer in. Um, is it possible to change the, some constants to make the new system inconsistent? No, the answer is no to that. Um, because uh, no matter what's over here, since you have a pivot position in each row, uh, the system's always going to be consistent. No, I was thinking the question was, is, is the system always consistent? And the answer to that is yes. Right? And that is because you have a pivot position in every row. So you're never going to end up with a row of all zeros and then something not zero over here. All right, another one. Is it possible that all solutions of a homogeneous system of two equations and four unknowns are multiples of one fixed non-zero solution? Hmm. Okay, homogeneous system, two equations, and four unknowns. Okay, so if you think about that, we've got two rows and four columns, so we have at least two free variables. Right? So if we wrote our solution in parametric vector form, assuming we had two free variables, then it would look like this. Now what this says is that each solution is a linear combination of two fixed non-zero solutions, right? Each one of these vectors is what they're calling a fixed non-zero solution. So we're going to have at least two of these vectors. So that means that um, it can't be the case that uh, all the solutions are, are just multiples of one non-zero solution. If that was the case, we would only have one vector here. And we can't have that because we have at least two free variables. All right, um, another one. Is it possible for a non-homogeneous system of three equations and two unknowns to have a unique solution for some right-hand side of constants? So three equations, two variables. All right, so that might look like this. Three equations, two variables. So, so you could have a pivot position in each column and you could have a row of all zeros. In that case, yes, the system would be consistent and there would be uh, a unique solution. All right, how about this one? Is it possible for such a system to have a unique solution for every right-hand side? And, okay, look at that. You could have this situation, still have pivot position in each column, but have zero, zero, something not zero, in which case there's no solution, right? So in this case, it's not possible for such a system to have any sort of solution for every right-hand side, right? In some cases, it's simply going to be inconsistent. All right, that's it for this one.